Hey, greetings from Seattle. This is the Monday morning live introduction to philosophy and theory class. My name is Julian, and to my left. Good morning. I'm Jeneline. We have Jeneline. <laughs> Today we are recording on a new device. This is my very new, brand new iPhone 12 mini. So hopefully the microphone is working. If it's not working, give us a little notification in the comment. If you're joining us for the very first time today, welcome to our global learning community. Every single Monday morning for the past two years, I've been hosting an introductory lecture, which is usually an introduction to the ideas of Slavoj Žižek, Jacques Lacan, usually also some Hegel and Kant and Marx sprinkled in there as well. The sound is not okay. Okay, that's good. I think we can't do sound with this unless we have a case or something. Generally, um, our producer <laughs> slash seducer is going to be helping us with the sound today. Um, you want something nope. to rest it on? We are currently in Seattle. <laughs> in suspense. We are in say. Seattle, and we're going to be here for about two weeks, enjoying the beautiful coast. And Jeline has procured a stand for us, so let us see if that provides better audio. Let's try that. We continue to have in indelible production values. Let's see. Is this better? Is the audio better now? We shall find out. Fingers crossed. We, will see. we appreciate the feedback and the patience, everyone. As Julian mentioned, we are in Seattle. So as always, let us know where you are joining us from. Uh, we just got back from some wonderful travels, uh, meeting with you guys and teaching abroad. That was delightful for us. So we just love having a global learning community. And thank you for joining us. That's right. Very big thank you to all of our patrons also who continue to fund this impossible dream, this project of bringing philosophy and theory open access to anybody who wants to join. It's been such an incredible blessing. And please do let us know where you are joining us from. I see someone is joining us from New York this morning, from Iran. Um, that is the biggest gift you can give us, is letting us know where you're joining us from. We see Scotland, we see Serbia. Um, that's just absolutely incredible. So, Bolivia, that is wonderful. And if you'd like to support our project in a monetary fashion, please head over to Patreon, where you can download my ebook. Um, it's called Five Keys to Zizek, Where Nothing is Lacking. And basically, the ebook tier on Patreon works as a subscription service. So every lecture series that we host here, open access on Instagram, is three months. And after every lecture series, Jenlyn and I release an ebook version of the classes so that you can read along with us, even if you can't keep up with every lecture. And currently, you can still get the previous ebook, which is Five Keys to Zizek, for another two weeks. At the end of the month, that book will disappear into the digital ether. So if you'd like to download Five Keys to Zizek, and if you'd like to support our dream, which is the dream of keeping open access to education alive, please do go over to Patreon and consider purchasing the ebook. That's www.patreon.com dash and Julian, or simply click the link in bio. On that note, today, we are going to be answering the substantial question, what is the sublime object? Of ideology. And before you say that sounds incredibly abstract, let me remind you that the sublime object of ideology is also the title of Zizek's most well-known book, also the first book that made him, let's say, acquire a wide readership amongst people who are into theory and philosophy. So today we're going to be answering the question, what is, this, what is the sublime object of ideology? And along the way, we're going to learn about the Freudian theory of das Ding, the thing. We're going to learn about the Lacanian theory of the objet petit a and the idea of jouissance, which is the fancy French way of referring to desire, Lacan's theory of desire. We're going to talk about Zizek's theory of ideology, which links up to Freud and Lacan. And finally, we may have time to talk about Marx's theory of the commodity and the commodity fetish. So we're going to try to compress all of that into a 60-minute lecture starting right now. And if you're a complete beginner, please stick around. This is an introductory class. We're going to try to make this as accessible and universal as possible without dumbing it down. 
Because that's always been the goal <laughs> of these classes, is to bring you philosophy and theory in an accessible way directly to your phone or your computer or your television, but in a way that maintains the complexity without succumbing to jargon and abstraction. Hopefully, there's always some abstraction <laughs> in these classes. Okay, so let's start with Zizek's most famous book. What is Zizek's most well-known book? Arguably, it is the sublime object of ideology. It's a relatively short book that is innovative in multiple ways. Way number one, it uses a lot of popular culture and film theory and the analysis of cinema to talk about Lacanian psychoanalysis, which is in and of itself already slightly unusual. The second way in which the book is innovative is that it quite concretely links Hegel, which is usually, who is usually considered as the, I don't know, the arch wizard of German idealism, to Lacanian psychoanalysis. Not a common combination, Hegel plus Lacan. Of course, for those of you who are already familiar with Zizek's work, you will understand that this is key to understanding Zizek that he takes speculative idealism from Lacan, links it with dialectical materialism from Marx, and then fuses it with Lacanian concepts that are psychoanalytic in nature. All of this is very unusual when he does it in the sublime object of ideology. And Zizek himself said that it was sort of a surprise that the sublime object of ideology became so famous, and what made him especially happy about it was that it didn't become successful amongst critics, nor did it become successful amongst his academic peers. Instead, the sublime object of ideology was almost a sleeper hit. It was something that was disseminated by students amongst themselves. And it became something that students were talking about and that they were reading. And it became a very popular book in that sense. And so if you're wondering where to start reading the works of Slavoj Žižek, apart, of course, plug, my own book, which is Five Keys to Zizek, if you want to read Zizek, usually people will recommend to you that you begin with the sublime object of ideology. Now, what's interesting about that is that Zizek has said that you really have to see the sublime object of ideology in tandem with the book that came out after it, which is The Tickless Subject. And he says it's almost ironic because The Tickless Subject is the quote-unquote more serious work in which he really develops his ideas and the sublime object of ideology was supposed to be something that he wrote that was a little bit more fun. Now, as is common, of course, with writers who are as prolific as Zizek, who are as productive, the one thing you don't get to choose is which of the books that you've written other people enjoy reading. And it just so happens to be that the sublime object of ideology has become Zizek's most well-known, most recognized book. Although I would still very much recommend that you read The Tickler Subject, but that's for another time. Okay, so let's break down the title, The Sublime Object of Ideology. We have here three concepts that contain a key as to Zizek's thinking. One, the sublime. Two, the object. And three, ideology. Now I'm gonna give you a very brief rundown of what those three terms mean, but that's gonna be very abstract. And so put that in your pocket, and then for the next 45 minutes, we will unpack what I mean by that. First of all, Lacan's definition of the sublime, remember we talked about this last week. Lacan says that the sublime is the object elevated to the notion of the thing. Now, this means that the sublime object is therefore the thing. And so the sublime object can be replaced by the word, the thing. And now we no longer have the sublime object of ideology. We have the thing of ideology. You also have to know that for Lacan, the thing is another word for what sustains desire, namely the objet petit a. And so now the sublime object of ideology is code for the thing of ideology, which is code for the objet petit a of ideology. So we've decoded the beginning. Again, very abstract. Put that, put that in your pocket for now. 
And what is ideology? Well, for Zizek, ideology is that which teaches us what and how. <laughs> I like that. The trash, the garbage truck of ideology just passed us. That's excellent. Very good timing. For Slavoj Zizek, ideology is that which teaches us what and how to desire. But more importantly, ideology is teaches us how to keep on desiring, which is another way of saying that ideology is that which gives structure to the manner in which we desire. And so now the sublime object of ideology becomes an almost tautological expression, which is that the sublime object of ideology is simply the object cause of desire, which is filled in by a system of desire. In other words, the manner in which we desire has to be governed, and that is what we call ideology. Now, what is the dominating feature, the object cause by which we continue to desire within our current mode of being within capitalism? It is the commodity and the commodity fetish. And so the key to the sublime object of ideology is that it is nothing more and nothing less than the commodity, namely the idea of money and monetary exchange. Now, that by itself isn't particularly mind-blowing. In fact, if you read my book, again, apology for the plug, Five Keys to Zizek, you will see that there's a chapter that says the sublime object of ideology is the commodity. But let's break that down into something more interesting. I've basically given you the formula, which you can put in your pocket. Now let's explain the formula in a way that will hopefully be more enriching to you, or at least more interesting. Let's start with Lacan's idea of the sublime. Lacan says that the sublime is the object elevated to the level of the thing. Now, in order to understand what that means, let's think about Freud. Because remember, for Lacan, everything that Lacan does is essentially a more radicalized Freud. A Freud turned on his head, usually to make some kind of metaphysical argument. But we'll get there. Freud has a theory which he calls the theory of totem and taboo, which is about the relationship between the sacred and the profane. But it's also about the relationship between prohibition and desire. Think about it for a moment. Often it's the very things that we're not allowed to have that we want, which is another way of saying that the things that you want are the things that you think you can't have. Which means that what appears to you as a prohibition actually stimulates a desire. You could say, for example, that this is true for any taboo. Any taboo comes together with its own kind of usually sexual fantasy. Think about the predominant category, at least I think it is, within internet pornography are themes of incest. Now, clearly, most people don't want to engage in incestuous behavior. In other words, the quote-unquote fantasy of incest doesn't prescribe or describe an actual desire. And so the Freudian insight, which you will recognize to also be a Lacanian one, is that when it comes to a taboo and when it comes to a fantasy regarding the taboo, what you're desiring isn't the thing that is taboo. What you're desiring is the prohibition itself. In other words, what makes it a fantasy isn't the fact that you want to have the thing that is forbidden to you. What makes it a fantasy is that you want it precisely because it is forbidden. And this is something really important that Zizek has also argued is that there is no secret core, no dangerous substance to most fantasies. In fact, Zizek goes even further. Zizek says quite clearly, he says, fantasy is sterile. Most fantasies are impotent. This is precisely the mistake that conservative religious people or conservative parents or any 
fearful person makes when they confuse the fantasy, for example, of their child with a desire for the thing itself. This is the argument... Oh, you were going to say something? Yeah, well, and it seems like it's not about overcoming the taboo. It's not about it's not about saying, I don't want this to just be a transgression. I want this to be my lived experience. Rather, it's about man- maintaining the taboo. It's about maintaining that distance. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the reason that the fantasy is sterile in that specific sense, that it is impotent, is because it doesn't desire going over the taboo. In fact, the fantasy is on the side of conservation. In other words, the fantasy, in order to remain fantasy, has to uphold the taboo. This is precisely why most taboo fantasies aren't transgressive in any sense. They uphold the taboo and find pleasure within the idea of transgression itself. Of course, you can make a somewhat facile link to the manner in which resistance functions within a consumer society. This is why fundamentally the idea of commodified resistance, whether it's a t-shirt of Che Guevara or it's a poster that you put up on your wall, is precisely on the side of conserving the system as it is. It's no longer an act of resistance. Instead, it is the pleasure of having a symbol of resistance which acts and serves only to maintain that pleasure within the given order. This is also why for Lacan, going back to Freud, within the sacred and the profane, fantasy is always on the side of the symbolic. And this is seemingly counterintuitive, right? Because we usually think that fantasy is about escape. That fantasy is something that we can fall into. That we have to be in reality. That we cannot live in the sky. And for both Freud and Lacan, fantasy functions exactly the other way around. Fantasy is what grounds us, thus the more, within a given reality. Within the coordinates of the symbolic. Fantasy is not an escape from the symbolic. Fantasy is what grants us access to the symbolic. Now, another example of this. If you think about the sacred and the profane, prohibition and desire, who is the ultimate symbol who embodies both desire and prohibition? Well, the ultimate symbol of both prohibition and desire is, of course, the idea of the monarch. For example, the queen in the United Kingdom. The queen is somebody who is, on the one hand, a very beloved figure in the United Kingdom. You could also say the queen is a very hated figure. In fact, that many people love hating the queen, as it were. There's an expression in Dutch that I find very apt for this. In Dutch, you can say, I love you, and it means, ik hou van je. But you can also say, I hate you, and it means, ik haat je. And if you merge those two, it's a quip in Dutch. You can say, ik haat van je, which means I hate of you. It's like saying, I love you, but you say, I love you, I hate you. And of course, this is precisely the pathological love and hate that Freud explains apropos the parent. Freud says that what the parent wants most from a child is affection. And yet when the child reaches a certain age, the child no longer wants to give affection because the child realizes that when it gives affection, it gives something of itself to the parent. And so the child wants to hold on to its own identity, but lacking any kind of positive identity in the world as such, still being a child, the child decides to assert its own autonomy by means of denying the parent affection. And so, for example, when the parent says, how was school? The child says, I don't want to talk about it. When the parent wants to give the child a hug or a kiss, the child turns away. This is one of the necessary features of identity and autonomy in adulthood is this turning away. And what the parent does at that point is absolutely crucial. Most parents, realizing that they can no longer receive affection from their children, will resort to a second, much more debased version of attention, which instead of affection, they simply want their child's attention. And so the parent begins nagging the child. And then the child becomes annoyed with the parent and asserts their annoyance apropos the parent. And so the parent who's nagging the child simply simply wants affection from the child. 
and the child simply wants to assert his or her own autonomy. And so we end up stuck in a relationship that is about mutual love that is expressed as a kind of mutual antagonism. And for Freud, antagonism thereby is never the opposite of love or affection. Antagonism is a form of repressed love and affection. Something similar, you were going to say? Yeah, this was so perfect in Everything Everywhere All at Once. I know we talked about that a few weeks, maybe even a few months ago. Yeah. But that beautiful scene where the mother is unable to express her love to her daughter except by saying, you've gotten fat. Or yeah, something yeah. that seems totally opposite of love. And so the question in this sort of philosophical tradi tradition is how do you deal with those kinds of contradictions? How do you deal with those sort of paradoxes that don't seem to resolve within that framework? Yeah. And, and vice versa, in Everything Everywhere All at Once, there's a scene in which the mother does what the daughter appears to want, which is to introduce her, her partner, who is another woman, to the grandfather, who is presumably not accepting of same-sex relationships. And then the mother does it. She introduces them both. She says, here is her girlfriend. And of course, at, exact that, like, at exactly that point, the girl no longer wants to be introduced, in a sense. Yeah. So something similar happens here with the idea of prohibition and desire with the monarch. And if you want a more universal contemporary version of that, you could simply say the celebrity in general. A celebrity is somebody who has to perform the dual task of seeming both impossibly distant to you and yet somehow closer to you than anybody else. You integrate the idea of the celebrity, the idea of who that person is, into your framework, into the manner in which you understand the world around you. You start using the celebrity's world experience or projected signified world experience as a frame through which you can articulate and understand your own world experience. Whilst at the same time, putting them on a pedestal, which makes them in some way superhuman, not real. And of course, though everybody knows this, the worst thing that you can do is to meet your heroes because of at least two reasons. One, when you meet your hero, by definition of meeting your hero, they are no longer your hero. They are simply an acquaintance at that point, right? In a sense, the very act of meeting your hero has almost like relegated them to the material earthly world. They are no longer a hero. They are simply somebody you have once met. And secondly, the reason you should never meet your heroes, apart from the fact that they could potentially be people you don't actually like and thereby suddenly you become conflicted as to whether or not you should worship them. The reason you shouldn't meet your heroes is because not only are they no longer heroes by virtue of meeting them, once you've met your hero, you necessarily need to find another hero. In other words, once you've punctured the ceiling that gives rise to the symbolic, the prohibition of your access to the symbolic, you will need to find some other governing order. This is the problem, of course, if you become successful or famous yourself, is that you realize that the people that you once worshipped and idolized are suddenly your peers. They're no longer the people that exist up in the heavens. And so, if suddenly the people that you once worshipped that were supposed to be the people that you followed that became a model for how you acted and thought and what you aspired to, if they suddenly become mere mortals like yourself, then you need to substitute them with some other kind of master. I'm convinced that this is why, for example, Tom Cruise became a Scientologist. is because once Tom Cruise became God, the only way to escape his godhood was to become a Scientologist. <laughs> that, this is my theory of Scientology, essentially. But I think this is anyone's experience who's met, like, uh, when you're a child, the first time you see, like, a t your elementary school teacher in right. a grocery store or something, this person that you associated with a particular realm of discipline and conformity to suddenly see them out in the real world where they are just another shopper like your parents... Yeah. makes you see them as just another person, and it diminishes their authority in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, you're very right. So here we're... I'm trying to balance the phone. <laughs> we'll see. I don't want to block the microphone. Now, we've already talked a little bit about the idea of the sacred, but the question is, why is the sacred related to the profane? And the first thing you have to emphasize here is that it's not that the sacred is up here and that the profane is where you end up. It's not that you have a ladder and a scale upon which the profane is the highest, uh, sorry, the profane, <laughs> Freudian slip, upon which the profane is the lowest, 
and the sacred is the highest. Instead, it's precisely the manner in which the profane seems to exist within the highest itself. Zizek has pointed out, and not only Zizek, that perhaps the most vivid example of the sacred and, per- and the profane happens precisely in the idea of taking communion within the Christian church. That the very idea of the hostie, the idea of eating the body of Christ, and the idea of the sublimation of Christ into the Trinity and the idea of the spiritual community implies also the necessary adverse of that, which in, in a very Zizekian vulgar manner is that whatever you eat, you will also have to shit. And so technically, if you are imbibing the body of Christ, and excuse my blasphemy here, this also means that you are at some point excavating the body of Christ through your own body. Excreting. But Excreting? Yes. What? Excavating? Did I say excavating? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Excreting the body of Christ through your own system. Now, of course, this is a little bit silly. This is Zizek. It's also Zizek's idea that Hegelianism, rather than being about the sublime sublimation into the absolute, is in fact the exact reverse of that, which is what he calls the idea of a constipated Hegel, a kind of system in which sublime is never properly sublimated. But the point here is that there's a very thin line between the sacred and the profane. The example that Freud uses is about young children who give their own excrement as a gift. And if you think about it, the way in which most parents raise their children and so-called potty train them is in that precise sense to celebrate going to the bathroom as an achievement, as a kind of creation, as an act of will. And that the child will, in fact, bring their potty or their excrement to their parents as a sign of their accomplishment. And that in this precise sense, we have a merger of the highest and the lowest. The idea in a very, like, German romantic sense of poetic expression that seemingly grows within you of its own volition and comes out versus the idea of an excremental gift that is delivered to the parents as such. Of course, it's precisely when, within certain types of conceptual art that we find the most literal expression of this, which is the idea of using urine and excrement as an actual material within painting as such. Not something that I necessarily endorse, but this is one way to explore that idea. Now, the idea of the sacred and the profane, perhaps the person who uses the irony of the sacred and the profane most profoundly is one of my favorite filmmakers. You will know this is Paolo Sorrentino, Italian filmmaker. And if you go to the opening montage of The Young Pope II, which is called The New Pope, you will find his signature stylistic feature apropos the sacred and the profane, which is that it starts with a scene of nuns, but essentially when the lights go out, the nuns all turn into strippers and they start dancing together in a kind of I don't know, very sexual, sensual manner. And both the young pope and the new pope are all about this irony, about the sexuality that is contained within the idea of spiritual enlightenment as such. And of course, this is precisely the taboo that exists within the idea of religion, which isn't to say that sexuality is a debased detraction from the metaphysical, from the sublime. But it's always the the other way around, that there is something sexual within the idea of the sublime itself, which necessarily has to be repressed. And so it's not just the fear and the knowledge that sexuality provides an alternate spirituality, an alternate access to the metaphysical, to the highest, to the idea of desublimation of the self within sexual enjoyment, which would be appearing to be a threat to the idea of spiritual salvation, It's specifically also the other way around, the recognition that within spiritual salvation, there's a kind of excess of individuality, of surplus enjoyment, of bliss, which at times can even appear to be sexual. And this repression of the sexuality and the desire and the enjoyment within the renunciation of the self is precisely the fruitful core that religion and Christianity in particular has to suppress at all times. You could call it the surplus value of the divine. And this is, of course, part of the whole practice of renunciation, is the paradox by which it's precisely through renunciation that individuality is experienced as its fullest. Think about maxims like 
you should give as much as possible because you're only happy if you're someone who gives. The idea of desubjectification is a form of desublimation by which paradoxically the self is experienced more fully precisely through renunciation of subjective selfhood. And this core, this secret truth within the Christian spiritual experience is at the one hand the key that allows it to keep on going, that provides it with a certain kind of drive, and yet at the same time is an unbearable truth that would unravel it from within. In other words, you could argue that the sexual is the real of the church, which is another way of saying that the profane is the real of the sacred. It is both that which sustains it and with, if inquired into, would undermine it from within. Yeah, I love, I think this is so fruitful, this notion that the paradox isn't what undermines it. The paradox is what propels it forward. Yeah. And the big example, especially in the church, is the issue of homosexuality. Because I think you've talked about this in previous classes, that there is um, widespread homosexuality within the Catholic church. And yet the question, I mean, for outsiders, the question is, why doesn't this undermine the authority of the Catholic church? Why aren't there gay priests working to undermine this prejudice wouldn't this serve the, their interest but it's exactly the opposite that for priests within the church who are homosexual it gives them additional power within the church and their and so it's not in their interest to overturn this this system so mm. rather than the paradox undermining their authority it's actually this paradox that gives them additional authority within the institution of the church i haven't explained that very well but. no no you've done, a, <laughs> you've done a good job no you've done you've done excellently it's a difficult thing to express and yeah. articulate mm -hmm. and you've done a good job with it i want to get back briefly to what we we're talking about with the idea of das ding or the thing that freud has now, when you hear the word thing, perhaps if you're into philosophy, one of the first resonances that word will have is the Kantian idea of the thing in itself. That's ding an sich. And yet, in typical Freudian psychoanalytic fashion, Freud almost seems to deny the metaphysical function of the Kantian ding. Now, for Kant, das ding... And thus, ding an sich is about the essence that appears only with an appearance. Within the traditional metaphysical divide, you have the ideal, the absolute, the world outside the cave, the world of truth, essence, versus debased material reality, the world of objects. And objects, for Kant, represent the essence, the truth. There is an ideal, a core within objects. And yet the paradox of objects is that in order to be objects, they have to appear to us. In other words, we have to conceptualize them by seeing them, by speaking them, by holding them, by articulating them. And so objects, even if they represent a core of truth, an ideal substance or essence, das Ding an sich, become debased as soon as they are internalized and made real through our conceptual framework. This is the metaphysical divide that Kant essentially upholds. Now, we don't need to delve into that too deeply, except to see that when Freud talks about das Ding, he actually talks about two different things, something that Lacan points out. Freud talks about die Sache and das Ding. Now, die Sache is very hard to translate, but you might be able to translate it as the thing as situation which an easier way to translate it is, of course, symbolic. Die Sache is the thing rendered in the symbolic. It's a German expression, which is die Sache selbst, which means the thing as to itself. An example of die Sache in the symbolic is, of course, how we relate to the idea of monarchy or celebrity. You cannot touch them. To touch the queen is a taboo. And yet, at the same time, there's no real reason why you can't touch the queen, except, of course, for the fact that as soon as you touch the queen, she becomes slightly less queen and slightly more human. The queen, after all, is supposed to represent the church, God on earth. And so we have to keep her at a distance, and yet we have to keep her close enough that she remains the queen. 
And this paradoxical situation is, of course, what makes the queen the figurehead, the masthead of the symbolic order. This is also why the queen is related to die Sache, but not the thing. When we get to the thing is only if we then, in fact, do touch the queen. Think about it. If, if a celebrity touches you, like holds your hand or kisses you like on the forehead or whatever, there's this usual sort of juvenile instinct to say, I will never wash my hand again. Of course, if you never wash your hand, your hand will be caked in dirt. And yet, strictly speaking, your hand would be caked in dirt so as to uphold the purity, the divine representation of the queen's lips or whatever that have touched your hand. This impossible short circuit by which you uphold the touch of the divine through a complete desac... Like a sacra... What is it? Desacra... Sacrilegious, but... No, no, no. Like becoming dirt. That the dirt mm-hmm. of your hand, the not washing of your hand, represents the purity of the queen. This particular paradox is when we're starting to pick at the impossible short circuit of the thing. And so die Sache is on the level of the symbolic. It's that which upholds the prohibition and the desire. Don't touch the queen. It's on the level of the taboo. And the thing is on the side of the real. It's the short circuit that we experience when we try to puncture this taboo, when we try to fully explore what makes the symbolic symbolic. And so what's important here is that Freud breaks down the thing into die Sache and das Ding, and die Sache is on the side of the symbolic, and das Ding is on the side of the real. And yes, someone in the comments said desecration. That de- Dese- desecration. desecration. That's exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> desecration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, there's a couple. I mean, there's many more things that we have to consider here. But let's go back to our original, our original idea, which was Zizek's the sublime object of ideology. Now we're talking about what is the sublime. For Lacan, the sublime is the object elevated to the notion of the thing. We now know that the thing, das Ding, is on the side of the real. It's the real that is within the symbolic, the kind of horrific core that represents the short circuit between the sacred and the profane, between prohibition and desire, in which there is an emptiness a priori to the idea of desire because there is nothing that we want save for the prohibition itself. This means that the wanting, the desire, is an empty husk because it revolves around the prohibition. There's nothing behind the prohibition that you actually seek except the desire for the prohibition itself. Vice versa, the real of the symbolic is that there is nothing behind the symbolic. There's nothing behind the queen that legitimizes her as queen. The whole point is that it is because she is queen that she is queen. It's a tautological relationship. In other words, there's no legitimacy to the queen, and it's precisely this absence of legitimacy that makes her the figurehead. This is the impotency not only of the queen, but also of the Republican argument, Republican in the French sense, that the monarchy is illegitimate because it is not elected. The whole point is that the monarchy is powerful precisely because it is illegitimate. The strength of the monarchy derives from its illegitimacy. The idea of an elected monarch would no longer be a monarch. It would no longer be the hero if you've elected the hero in that sense. This is also, we've quoted quoted this at ad nauseum, but it's the, I think it's Robespierre, in the French Revolution, who says, we're not putting the king on trial to determine whether or not he is a good king. We're putting the king on trial because he is king. There's another quote that relates to this about the Dreyfus affair that Jenlin and I both read a book about recently, in which the lawyer, there was an assassination attempt on, uh, assassination of yes. Dreyfus. Attempt. As- attempt, thank mm-hmm. you. Assassination attempt on Dreyfus. And the lawyer for the would-be assassin argued that it had, in fact, not been an assassination attempt because the man was not shooting at Dreyfus. 
the man was shooting at Dreyfusism. In other words, the ideology of Dreyfus instead of Dreyfus. Now, the properly Hegelian response to this anecdote is, of course, to say that we never shoot at the person or the thing. We only ever shoot at the idea of the person. And the Lacanian extraction from this Hegelian note, which is probably what Zizek would argue, is therefore that there is no person to shoot at to begin with. That the idea of the person on sich is precisely the fantasy. That you only ever shoot at the idea of the person. I didn't shoot at him, I shot at the idea of republicanism. I didn't shoot at the queen, I shot at the idea of the monarchy. And there's a very, in a very Hegelian sense, this is also precisely why the abstract and the concrete are always reversed. For Hegel, the abstract is precisely the more concrete. Dreyfusism is more in Dreyfus than Dreyfus. Apologies for the pronunciation. Now, I'm trying to rein this in, but it's very methodical, trust me. If the sublime object is the object elevated to the level of the thing, and the thing is on the level of the real. Yeah, someone in the comments mentioned Shinzo Abe here, which is another good example of this, right? But of course, you know what's, I'm gonna go on a riff here, but you know what's, what's interesting and paradoxical about the assassination of Shinzo? Of course, the assassination of Shinzo is interpreted as giving a full mandate to Shinzo's party. And so nothing, and I don't want to be cynical here, but nothing could be more beneficial to the idea of Shinzoism than the assassination of Shinzo in that sense. But this is also, this gets back to what we've been talking about throughout this class, this notion that some that the paradox what appears to undermine it. What appears to undermine it reinforces it. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of the painful things that we've seen, I think, within the last couple of years is that somebody who believes something that is totally irrational, totally not factual, political, ideological, you give them a fact or an argument that should absolutely pierce their narrative, something that is completely and utterly contradictory to their beliefs. Instead of ignoring it, they will always incorporate it back into their own fantasy. Instead of saying, I refute this, it will simply be woven back into the fabric of the fantasy that they have. Anyway, back, back to the point here. <laughs> and so we've talked about das Ding, and das Ding breaking down into die Sache, which is in the realm of the symbolic, and das Ding, which is the... In a sense, that which cannot be confronted. For Lacan, das Ding is that which goes beyond signification. It's the short circuit. It's the trauma within the idea of das Ding itself. That which you cannot confront straight on. For example, within prohibition and desire, it's the notion that what you desire is the prohibition itself. Now, if we know that the sublime object is the thing, then it's also important to note that Lacan relates the thing to the idea of the objet petit a. What is the objet petit a? Well, first of all, it's probably one of Lacan's most well-known ideas. Let's start with that. And the objet petit a, this is very important, but also very simple, is the little a because it is the little other. Objet petit a, the a stands for autre, Objet petit a is the little other, which is contrasted to the idea of the big other. Now, if the big other is on the level of the symbolic, then the little other is on the level of the real. Again, not because we have the big other up here and the little other, which is a regression from the big other, but precisely because the little other is the real within the big other. And what is the objet petit a in that sense? The objet petit a is related to Lacan's theory of desire, which means that the objet petit a is never the object of desire. It's not what you want. It's the object cause of desire. It's the manner in which you keep on wanting. And let's go back to the idea of prohibition versus desire, versus die Sache and das Ding. If die Sache, the symbolic, is the prohibition, then das Ding is the fact that you don't want 
what is prohibited to you, you want the prohibition itself. That's does ding. It's that which goes beyond the thing, that which goes beyond the prohibition. It's not, I want this thing that is prohibited to me. I want the prohibition itself. It is that which goes beyond signification. And so if we relate that to the idea of the big other and the little other, the big other is the symbolic order, the taboo. It's the prohibition. It's the governing logic. And the objet petit a is thereby not what we desire. It's not the objective content oh, I want incestuous sex because it's not allowed. It's precisely the surplus. Namely, I want the prohibition itself. And so what doesn't get emphasized enough is that within the Lacanian psychoanalytic framework, the big other and the little other aren't contrasted. It's not that the big other is in the sky and the little other is here in the world. It's that the little other is the crack within the big other itself and a crack that doesn't undermine it, a crack that sustains it. Which is also why for Lacan, the objet petit a is never the object of desire. It's never the formal content of the thing you desire, but the object cause of desire. Now, what is the object cause of desire? Are we doing too much? No? Okay. What is the object cause of desire? Well, now you can very clearly see what the object cause of desire is. Namely, for Lacan, the object cause of desire is, strictly speaking, the same thing as the Lacanian formula for jouissance or desire. What is the Lacanian formula for jouissance? It is that we desire desire itself. In other words, the thing that we desire is simply to keep on desiring. And the thing that we fear, being the opposite of desire, is the fulfillment of desire. Now you can understand Lacan's addition to Freud's theory of anxiety. Freud's theory of anxiety, I've mentioned this before, is that anxiety is the experience of loss or the anticipation of loss. And not just any loss, but the object of desire. So for Freud, when you lose the object of desire you experience anxiety. And the primordial object of desire is the mother. And so separation from the mother produces anxiety in us. A productive anxiety, if you will. A anxiety in which this lack has to be substituted through selfhood. For Lacan, as always with Lacan, it's Freud, but with a twist. Anxiety isn't fear of the loss of the object of desire. Anxiety is fear of the loss of desire itself. Now, if desire is thereby the flip side of anxiety, namely, I have lost the object of desire, therefore I desire, then we end up in this short circuit, which is the short circuit of the real, which is thereby the short circuit, a constitutive necessity of desire, which is to say that we don't become anxious because we have been separated from that which we want. We become anxious as soon as we get too close to that which we want. In other words, for Lacan, if desire is desire for desire itself, then anxiety is the possibility that we would be reunited with the object of desire. In other words, anxiety for Lacan is the anxiety of reaching the supposed formal content of the object of your desire, and suddenly realizing that it is empty, that it is hollow, that there is nothing behind the veil of desire. That the thing that you thought you were chasing isn't real. It's not there. That as soon as you reach it, it, poof, blows up like a bubble in your face. And of course, here we have exactly the paradox of the real within the symbolic, which is that as soon as you meet your hero, your hero is no longer your hero. What you thought you wanted, which was to meet the person who gave symbolic governance to your idea of selfhood and aspirations, by means of meeting that person, they've canceled themselves out. They can no longer be your hero. They are now merely your friend or acquaintance. This is the inverse, of course, of Freud's theory of parental aggression. Freud says that as soon as the father lashes out in anger or in aggression 
the father has already lost his authority. And so the paradox of the father is that the father wants to assert his authority in a manner that thereby renders him impotent. And vice versa, flip side of the coin, it's precisely the father's perceived impotence, which is that he is so powerful that he doesn't need to act, which maintains his power. And within that revolving short circuit, we have the idea of the name of the father. Namely, parental authority is never asserted. Parental authority is in name only. Now, what is another form of authority that is in name only? It's precisely the idea of the authority of the monarch, the authority of celebrity, which leads you to the much more radical realization that all authority is in name only, which leads you to the properly revolutionary insight that if all authority is in name only, then the way to resist that authority is not by fighting it, but by exposing the fact that it is in name only. And that is, of course, the Marxist insight, that class and worker consciousness isn't saying we will raise an army of workers to fight the elites. It's to say that once you realize that the working class is no natural class, you've exposed the idea that authority is in name only. But that's for another time. We still have a couple of things to cover. And like, mm -hmm. what, 10 minutes left. So to go back to the original question, what is the sublime object of ideology? If the sublime object is the thing, and the thing is one of the two parts of die Sache and das Ding, in other words, the thing is the real and the symbolic, then we still haven't answered the last part, which is what is ideology? Well, we've already related the idea of das Ding to desire. Lacan's formula for desire is that what we desire is, the di is desire itself. What we fear is the absence of desire. What we fear is realizing the emptiness within desire itself. And I have to emphasize that this is different from the Buddhist notion that you simply have to rid yourself of all, all earthly desire and wanting. Because the Buddhist notion upholds a transcendental ideal that behind the veil of desire lies truth. For Lacan, the truth, the secret of desire is precisely that there is nothing behind or beyond desire. That even if you rid and strip yourself of desire, you simply end up with the surplus desire of the stripping itself. In other words, we're back at the Christian core of the sacred and the profane, which is that retained within the idea of de-subjectification is the secret surplus core, which is the affirmation of a kind of absolute subjectivity. And it's precisely the repression of that supposed undermining from within, the real, that the symbolic can be upheld. And so for Lacan, there's a difference between the idea of vulgar Buddhism here, right? Because I'm simplifying. The idea that beyond desire lies true selfhood. For Lacan, true selfhood isn't beyond desire. True selfhood lies precisely within the paradox of desire. I've mentioned this many times before, but Lacan's maxim is that if you renounce desire, right, if you deny the body, you become denial embodied. You cannot go beyond that point. Now, if the formula of desire is that desire is for desire itself, that there is nothing behind the veil of desire, then this means what we really want is to keep on desiring, to sustain our desire, to never fulfill it because we cannot fulfill it because there is nothing within the fulfillment. There's only a kind of radical emptiness. This is where ideology comes in. Zizek's theory of ideology is in a sense very traditional because what is ideology? Ideology is the idea and logos. It's the logos of the idea. If the idea is within platonic metaphysics, the absolute essence, the truth, then logos is what has to give order to the idea of the absolute. And so the very word ideology is a, almost a paradox. The idea that you have something which is of essence, which is grounded in itself only, that's ding an sich, has to be manif made manifest in some f logical form of appearance, namely logos. The idea that you have a logos of the idea in itself renders the idea debased. What's beautiful about the word ideology is thereby that the word ideology itself renders in a formula the dialectic of the sacred and the profane. If the sacred and the profane is the fact that the secret core of the 
of the sacred is the profane, then ideology is that the secret core of the idea is logos. That within the fall into logos, we have the manifestation of the ideal. Here you can already start seeing how within Lacan there's a metaphysical argument that isn't in Freud. The metaphysical argument, which is that there is nothing beyond appearance. There's no essence. There's only essence appearing within appearance itself, which is precisely Hegel's argument, Hegel's metaphysical contribution to the Fichtian gauntlet that was thrown down after Kant's so-called transcendental turn, by which in the so-called metaphysical divide between essence and appearance, suddenly the subject becomes the predominant feature, namely the manner in which the essence appears within subjective reason itself. Think about Kant's most famous work, The Critique of Pure Reason. Pure reason is the same paradox of ideology, idea and logos. Pure idea, logos, reason. Kant's critique of pure reason is thereby, in a sense, the primordial critique of ideology. The first critique of ideology you find within Kant's critique of pure reason. It's the manner in which the idea is made manifest through logos. Now, ideology, of course, as we know it, is political. It's ideological. And yet for Zizek, the idea of ideology is never that you step outside of it. For Zizek, the most ideological thing is to promise somebody that they can step outside of ideology. In other words, Zizek is making an almost in-group in joke about the idea of a pre-Kantian metaphysics, which is to say that the idea that there is essence behind appearance is itself an ideological assumption. It, it breaks apart from within. Now, of course, Zizek has in mind that ideology is political, right? It is a political ideology. It is the manner in which we see the world. But Zizek doesn't mean that it's like a boxed set. Zizek doesn't believe that you have ideologies that come preformed. I am, you fit somewhere along I'm a Republican. Spectrum. I'm a Democrat. There's no political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Instead for Zizek, ideology can be quite clearly defined as that which gives meaning to what we see. In other words, it's a metaphysical argument. If the world exists of objects in and of themselves that appear to you, then the manner in which they appear to you has to be given meaning through some sort of frame, some sort of coordinates. And if you think about it, the frame in which a meaning appears to you, in which objects represent things, is precisely, therefore, on the level of the symbolic. And to go back to the Lacanian idea of thus thing, thus ding, it's the real in the symbolic. And what is the real in the symbolic? It's precisely the idea that the way in which things appear to us isn't given a priori an sich. It's not natural. It's filled in retroactively through the manner in which we view them. In other words, ideology, idea and logos is overdetermined not by the idea, not by essence. It's overdetermined by appearance itself. It's overdetermined by the manner in which we fill in that meaning through our own subjective participation. And this real, the thing that should supposedly undermine the symbolic, is precisely what sustains it. Because there is nothing behind that appearance. There is nothing that you want in the prohibition except the prohibition itself, which links to the Lacanian formula that there is nothing in desire except desiring desire itself. And now we can go back to Zizek's formula, which is the title of his book, namely, The Sublime Object of Ideology. If ideology is that which gives meaning to what we see and gives structure to the horizon in which desire plays out, then the sublime object, being das Ding, being the objet petit a, being the object cause of desire, being desire for desire itself of ideology is thereby simply the commodity. The sublime object of ideology is the commodity because what governs the way in which we make sense of what we see in the world? It's the commodity. It's the commodity fetish. And now we can get to the secret subversive core within Marx's theory of the commodity fetish. After all, the formula for Marx's theory of the commodity fetish is that we see objects, uh, sorry, that we treat people as things and things as people. 
which is never about the desubjectification of people. It's never just saying, oh, we just treat people as pawns within capitalism. This would be vulgar critique of capitalism. Instead, it's precisely the dialectical metaphysical argument in which things appear only as people and people only as things. In other words, that essence appears through subjective overdetermination and not vice versa. Which is to say that for Zizek, the sublime object of ideology, that which sustains our desiring within an ever-expanding horizon of wanting, is precisely the commodity experienced as a self and the self experienced as commodity. Short circuit the tautological overlap between the idea of selfhood and the idea of commodity, which is for Marx the idea of the commodity fetish. That is the sublime object of ideology. It is the commodity. It is the fact that the way in which we give meaning and which we sustain the meaning of the world around us is precisely that we don't want the actual physical commodity. We don't want the thing. We want the commodity fetish. We want to keep on desiring. And another word for keeping on desiring is consumerism within capitalism. And so we've made our way from the idea of the sublime object, which is das Ding, which is also the objet petit a, which is never the object of desire, but the object cause of desire, namely the formula of jouissance, which is that we desire desire itself, which has to be governed by an overarching ideology, which fills in the gap, the constitutive tension between idea and logos, which itself is the overdetermination of the subjective upon the realm of metaphysical essence, which, in a very abstract way, all leads us to the idea that what sustains us within late-stage capitalist consumerist society is precisely not the fact that we want more things, but that we want to keep on wanting. In other words, Zizek is making an argument about the fact that what sustains ideology is what sustains capitalism, which is the idea of the commodity fetish. And so finally, we see how Zizek relates the Hegelian metaphysical idea, which that essence appears only in appearance itself, to the Lacanian theory of jouissance, which is desire for desire itself, to the Freudian idea of das Ding, to the sublime, which is, again, the sublime for Lacan, simply object elevated to the level of the thing. And what is object elevated to the level of the thing? It is the commodity. The theory of the commodity for Marx is thereby rendered through the language of Lacanian psychoanalysis, which is that the object elevated to the level of the thing is the commodity, the commodity is also the human being as object rendered to the level of the thing. And the short circuit between human subjectivity and object elevated to the level of the thing as commodity is precisely the real within the symbolic, the symbolic of capitalism, a world which we can no longer imagine not existing. That is the idea of human consciousness that Zizek has within capitalism, which he calls the sublime object of ideology. That's it. <laughs> That's it in an hour. <laughs> Sorry to like get so amped, but like, I hope that if you take apart the little pieces of this lecture, you will find it's very clearly structured. I'm not just <laughs> oozing abstraction into your face, I hope. <laughs> On that note, thank I you say guys. That, I say this every week, but I always look forward to transcribing these lectures because <laughs> there's some parts that are silly and seem unrelated. And then there are parts like the last two minutes where it's like, yes, I need to go back and read Sorry. that and think about it a bit more. No, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that there's something that I want to go back to. So I look forward to working <laughs> on the transcript, well, which will be posted shortly. The truth is that I'm very lucky to have married an editor. <laughs> <laughs> because generally, in, and an editor isn't just a proofreader. Like an editor, it's a very specific gift and a skill and a craft. And generally, in, I'm so grateful to you that you do edit these lectures and that you try to find yeah. the nuggets, the diamonds <laughs> in the rough. And also a big thank you to everybody watching. Because yeah. like, I know it's kind of weird to go on camera and just for an hour, just like go full tilt philosophy. But it really makes me very happy. And I hope that it gives you guys some energy too. So thank you guys. Um... As always, yes. if you would like to read these lectures in a digestible format, my introduction to Zizek, Five Keys to Zizek, is available as an ebook for another two weeks. After that, we will delete it forever because that gives me surplus enjoyment. <laughs> and basically, if you subscribe to Patreon, every three months you get a new ebook. And the ebook is always based on the lectures. It's a condensed version of the lectures, edited by Jeneline, rewritten by moi. And right now, if you go to Patreon, you can download Five Keys to Zizek, which basically one entire chapter is dedicated to what is the sublime object of ideology. 
and every chapter is like a breakdown of one of Zizek's key ideas. Like, what is, who is the most sublime hysteric? What is the sublime object of ideology? What is the subject of the unconscious, etc.? So if you'd like an introduction to those ideas in a way that you can sort of digest on your own time, then you can find that on Patreon. Um, and that also keeps this project alive. It allows Jenlene and me to keep traveling and teaching and writing and reading and just filling our life with things that give us joy and that we can then hopefully use for ideas to hopefully bring you some joy. On that note, thank you guys so much for bringing us such a happy beginning to our week. We love starting our week this way. Mm -hmm. It feels so energizing. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope that you take that energy with you. So on behalf of, I don't know, I can't speak on behalf of anybody, but on behalf of, I don't know, on behalf of my eternal joy. Yes. Thank you for starting your week with us. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Wherever you are, we want to send you kinship and hopefully inspiration. So we love you all, and we will see you all in the bonus session, which starts in five <laughs> minutes. In five minutes, we're going to be taking your answers. No, you're going to, sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> yes, we're we are going to be questions. taking your answers. This is your usually answers. your job. Yeah. We're going to take your answers, and we're going to turn them into questions. So we That's, cannot yeah, yeah, wait. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to talk about that more in the discussion. So if you'd like to join us for the... Q&A that's going to start in five minutes and that's available to all of our patrons. If you'd like to become a patron starting at just five dollars a month, um, just click the link in bio. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to pick it up. All right. Thank you guys. See you soon. <laughs>